Hello and welcome to the breakdown. Yes, we're in lockdown still. We've got a few more days to go in front of us before we get to level three. But reality is there's still plenty to talk about. Wherever you're joining us from, Rugby Pass, New Zealand Herald or on Sky, of course. This is us. We're going to talk rugby. Mills Muliaina, Bernadine Oliver Kirby. And there he is, Sir John Kerwin and Mills. We're coping, but as usual, there's still plenty going on on the rugby landscape around the world. Yeah, there certainly is. Goldie, isn't there? Uh, still quite a bit of uncertainty, I, I suppose, in some ways, but sort of trying to bring all that together. And, you know, there's still plenty to talk about, which is uh, which is actually quite good. JK, for you, the fact there's plenty of stuff that is, uh, I suppose, we want to know about. There's plenty to, they're going to, I suppose, determine the direction this game's going to go in the short term. Yeah, lots, lots inspiring me at the moment, Jeff. You know, around all the parties working together, and a lot of stuff upsetting me, mainly at world rugby level. So, you know, I think there's some great stuff going on, but we're at a we're at a crossroads in our game, and we need to make some pretty big calls, I reckon. Yeah, you know, Bernie, you're going to get us up to date on everything, but we're in lockdown for another three weeks. Essentially, you're going to be at home. How are you going? And how much yeah. is it about you finding out exactly what rugby is all about and how motivated are for you to tell us what's going on? Yeah, put on the pink shirt today. I needed a pop of colour, something bright because uh, it's Groundhog Day at the moment. So uh, we're all hurting yeah. a little bit, aren't we? But Dan Carter, he's been amazing on social media. Not so much about his garden that he's, he's growing in the back lawn of his Auckland home at the moment, but the fact that he is throwing in the town with the uh, Kobe Steelers, his Japan club. Um, obviously, the competition has ceased. And what we thought would come next was his, you know, I'm hanging up the boots. His retirement, it never happened. So you can imagine that Rumerville is going gangbusters as to what DC is going to do. Uh, Super Rugby, that's parked up. We don't know what's happening with that. There is conversation around him joining the Major League Rugby in America and the New York Club. Imagine that. DC, not in DC, but in the big NY, the big New York. That would be insane. Uh, it's a hotbed for lots of international stars to go there and earn money. It's very lucrative. In fact, their league's been cancelled, yet they are playing all their players or paying all their players uh, their full wage. So that's how financially lucrative that market is. What I think is absolutely mouthwatering is the prospect of him coming to play Mitre 10. But who would he play for? He was a crusader. Would it be Canterbury or would it be where he resides in Auckland, lads? One thing that we have, and this is the problem with Mills because he can't get back to Auckland for another three weeks because he's now a resident of Waihe, Dan Carter... <laughs> Pays his rates in Auckland. He must play for Auckland. Done. That's hey, it. You, hey, you know there's another franchise across the bridge. There's another team. They're called North Harbour, JK. There are other teams around. Counties Manukau. He could be there, Mills. I hear Mills is thinking about it. Not really. But I, I, I'd love to see him maybe lace them up in this competition. I don't know, Mills, if I'd be going to New York soon. Well, yeah, I don't think... Gee, I mean, the, the rumour Mills are out there. But certainly going, going over to America at the moment where... You know, COVID-19 is, uh, you know, pretty hectic at the moment. So I, I've heard that it's actually going down in the cargo. He's going to play for Southland. Give back to the old, the old grassroots. Stags. Yes, yeah. I like it, Bernie. I like it. Heading south. Do you oh, reckon? Look. Tell you what, speaking of players being abroad, uh, a lot more of the Aussie players might be heading north um, to, to get some, some game time. Not, not that there's anything happening at the moment, but I think what's happening with the Aussie union to try and sweeten the deal where they're taking a pay cut is some flexibility in their contracts. I think they've negotiated the fact that a lot of them can take short-term contracts out of contracts elsewhere to actually get some, some money in the back pocket. Uh, where they would play is the big question, but you're talking about some of the big names, you know, your Wallabies, your, your Michael Hooper, your, your Matt Tamua. You know, these are big names that obviously want to play, want to earn some money. So we could see some of the Aussies heading off. Who does that benefit? And long, short term, is that a concern? Uh, Jake, uh, I can say this, Bernie, for me, JK and Mills, this, this confirms exactly how dire things are across the Tasman right now in terms of they've got no security, uh, they've got no broadcast deal for 2021, JK. Um, there were some very nervous players in Australia right now and they've basically put in the sabbatical clause because they're trying to find a way to keep some players uh, on their books. Yeah, and I just actually think it's smart. I think it's smart. You know, our game's in reset. We don't know what our game looks like. It's pretty... Uh, not, you know, it's common knowledge that the Australian Rugby Union are going through a bit of a tough time. And I mean, so it just makes sense. I mean, they've got to try and retain their players. If that means them doing short-term contracts in Japan or the Northern Hemisphere when that opens, just makes sense to me. We've got to do whatever we can do, and especially across the ditch. You know, we want our 
Australian brothers to be strong. So do what you need to do to, to, to retain them at the moment. It, it is goodwill from the from the union, a, a smart act. You know, they need to sort of start thinking about those sort of things. But it just goes to show your, your point before, some of the things that might have frustrated you, JK, the fact that we really need to get our game in order and, and, and in different parts of the world too. I mean, I think that's the priority at the moment, making sure everything is in order. Mills, you talk about the game getting um, itself in order globally. Well, World Rugby is going to vote on who the next leader is. Um, so we spoke last week to Augustine Pichot and also uh, Bill Beaumont. They're the two people who have got their, their hats in the ring right. What we're looking at now is it's almost like a North versus South. I can see JK shaking his head. Danza is probably going to be backing show right and you've got um the northern hemisphere who are probably going to be backing beaumont the incumbent what that does there's a lot of conjecture that this is going to strengthen the power play with the tier two nations that the likes of japan usa samoa fiji they're going to have more pull and more say in those deciding votes it's going to happen jk the vote's bernie, going to bernie do you know what i like about this is that usually he's shaking his head at me he's now <laughs> shaking his head at you the fact Don't that this you is your fault this is your fault. This is all, it's always, usually it's my fault. Now it's your fault you're bringing things up that he doesn't want to talk about. I cannot believe that you honestly believe that the second tier nations are going to get anywhere under this current constitution. So you've managed to, I was having a good day, Bernard, and you've managed to rob <laughs> me a wee bit because what good. they'll do, what they'll do is that because the constitution is totally wrong, I don't even talk about it. No. Now, we'll, uh, we'll get into it in part two. We're going to look at this in part two. We're going to be brief exactly what's going to be happening this weekend coming out of World Rugby. What else, Bernie? Absolutely. I'm not, look, don't shoot the messenger, JK, because there's a lot of talk about those two, tier two nations. But as you know, too, there's an awful lot of politicking, and I suspect that will play a huge part in this. Moving on to something a little more lighthearted, though. If you've got spare half a million dollars in your back pocket, would you buy a pair of shorts and a ripped pair at that? Well, you might if you're a Jonah Lomu fan, because one man has got a hold of his shorts from the 1996 Super 12 final. The Blues, which they won that game, that final against the Sharks, are half a million bucks on Trade Me for those shorts. How would they look in the pool room, you reckon, boys? Oh, Mills will have that. He'll be, he'll be bidding early. He'll be bidding early. That's right uh, up his alley, Mills. It's a buy now. There's a buy now. Is there a buy now? There's, no, I've got no, uh, pretty... <laughs> Pretty amazing thing, though. I mean, when you when you think of it, and I can't actually remember who was holding on to them when those shorts came off, but uh, uh, a pretty decent pair of shorts. And um, you know, I heard it's going to charity as uh, the well, the funds are going to charity as well. So good cause, but you won't be finding half a million dollars in uh, in my back pocket there, um, Jeff. Yeah, it was uh, well. To be fair, there was plenty of material used. They, they weren't they weren't small shorts, J.K. <laughs> they weren't small shorts. No, I mean, I I I, uh, I nearly had a little cry the other night seeing that a uh, hundred year old British soldier doing a hundred laps of his garden, and that that made me cry. And he's raised six million dollars. So amazing. You know, if, if someone out there does have the money, and you know, Jonah may rest in peace. And if the money's going to a real charity that's going to help during this time, uh, you know, bring it on. That's what I reckon. Six million, Absolutely. I think it's about 30 million, JK. The old oh, world. Really? Incredible. Outstanding. Outstanding. There's no doubt the landscape, it continues to change. Last week, I had the opportunity to talk to Rob Nickel and Sam Kane from the Players Association. Great tonight to have Sam Whitelock, Les Elder. Two people have been a big part of the discussions going forward and maybe what rugby is going to look like in 2020. And Sam, welcome home. You've had a trip to Japan. You've come back. you settled back in and I'll tell you what, unprecedented times for you. Who have you been talking to over the last little wee while in terms of our getting back on the rugby field? Yeah, it's uh, great to be home. Uh, have been pretty busy uh, talking to a whole lot of different people. I've had a few uh, calls, um, you know, conference calls like we're doing right now. Um, had one with, or quite a few with the RPA, um, which I'm a board member with, and um, a couple with all the um, leaders from Super, Super Rugby um, sides. I'm trying to understand what the challenges are. And then also a bigger conference school with um, the heads of Super Rugby, the PUs, uh, men's game, women's game, sevens, um, and also the New Zealand Rugby Union. So it's um, pretty challenging times and some uh, really good brains put together. And hopefully we're coming out with some great solutions. Yeah, Sam. So 
I mean, really challenging times for everyone. I think the interesting thing that we've learned over the through last few weeks is the different complexities around contracting, you know, central contracting, people playing overseas. I know you've got family in France as well. I mean, is there a certain part of the players that you're more concerned about of others or is this spread across everyone? I think it's um, spread right across everyone. Uh, there's different challenges for different people, um, no matter where they are in their professional career, whether they're new to the game and maybe only a couple of months into their first contract or if they you know, have um, loved ones being kids, husbands, wives, and how that um, affects them and the challenges that they have to face uh, as a as a family. Uh, Les, in, in, in six weeks' time, you're, you're expecting, you were planning to be back out on the field later on this year performing for the Black Ferns. Uh, for you, the conversations around the women's game and the direction it might take towards the back end of this year? Yeah, I mean, there's been, like Sam, there's been a lot of discussions um, with the RPA. We've had three or four meetings with them. We've got girls representing us on different... Um, working groups, which has been really good. And we've had some communication too with Kate Sexton, um, head of women's rugby and the Blackburn, Blackburn coaches. So there's a lot of discussion going on around the possible solutions or, or what the structures could look like. Um, you know, there's still talks of end of, end of year tour and things like that. Um, so there's still stuff to look forward to. Sam, there's a contemplation of the fact that there may not be any international games here. How many scenarios, or here this year, or you might not tour, how many scenarios have you as a group had to really put in place in front of you? And and the fact that what is the appetite like at each different level? The fact is there excitement about what you're going to be able to produce regardless of the situation that presents itself? Yeah, there's a number of scenarios that uh, that we're going through, whether we start, you know, the first of a month, whether it's 15 days in or the end of that month and kind of doing that all through the year and working out, A, can we play domestically, um, men's, women's, sevens, etc., or can we actually play internationally or does it start domestically and then a couple of months in, uh, the, the borders open up and we can travel to, um, you know, overseas in Australia or Japan um, or the traditional Sansa um, countries. So all those different possibilities and things have been looked at and there's a number of calendars out there that we're debating, looking at. But the reality is, um, as Liz said, we've got, as players, we're just going to be ready to go. And when we do get the information from the government saying, look, we can get into it at this level, then we've got to go. And Sam... We're talking about, I think we've got a fantastic product right now, right? But we're talking about global game, global competitions. I personally believe that our game needs a restart. I mean, as players, what would you love to see change out of this? Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think for myself, the biggest thing that I love about rugby is the competitive edge. So I love playing against the best teams in the world, whether that's through club rugby, um, provincial, super rugby, or internationally, I think having those big games where, you know, the start of the week, you've got that not in the, the stomach straight away. So I'm not sure how that fits in, but I think when you have those big games more often, it's pretty awesome. But also getting the balance right. You can't play every single week of the whole year because it becomes repetitive. So I'd say if ideally you'd have three or four games, then a bye to keep the quality of rugby as high as it can be. Well, Les, there's a pretty important vote going on at World Rugby coming up. They are all talking about this ability they may have to try and get this global season, the line, the calendar. How important would it be for the women's game if they were able to do that? Yeah, it'd be really important. I mean, um, like I said earlier, the momentum that's been created, um, this will allow for that to continue. Um, I guess the positive, too, is that we've got, you know, a Rugby World Cup next year, the Olympics next year. So I think first and foremost, though, for us right now, there's an opportunity to um, really get our domestic competitions right. And hopefully that allows for us to still tag alongside, well, not tag alongside, but double head um, some of those NDE or those test matches with um, the All Blacks and things like that. Sam, is everything on the table? We've, we've been hearing, you know, if we do, and let's all hope that we do get, um, you know, 
released and able to travel internationally. I mean, could we see the All Blacks playing just after Christmas or a Boxing Day test match? I mean, are you talking about everything or trying to stay within our season still? We are talking about everything. Um, and it all kind of comes down to when the season starts. So we're kind of taking this approach at the moment of, we're, we're actually in off season at the moment, and then when we get the, the green light, there's going to be a three to four week um, lead in before a competition can start because we've got to obviously, you know, scrum against each other and line outs and contact and all, all those things that make rugby so great. So, yes, we are talking about everything. Um, also, you know, we're looking at all black trials, north versus south. So, we are looking at different material if we cannot travel international uh, internationally. So, I think some of those things would be quite cool. I know for myself, I've never played a North versus South and I've heard a few great stories about um, a few years ago how it used to be the grudge, mat, the grudge match of the, of the year. So it'd be quite cool to be involved in one of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure there's no doubt about that. You talk about your off-season. Les, your off-season's been a little bit different though. Like I say, six weeks until you are due. How are you coping with things? And for you, uh, this lockdown, uh, the challenges of that, um, have things been all good in your family household? Yeah, I mean, uh, when you look at perspective of what some people are going through and people losing jobs and, you know, families with kids and who are essential workers and trying to organise that single mum, that sort of thing. Um, I've been really fortunate to still be living in a warm, comfortable house where I'm still working from home. Um, I'm right across the road from the field so I can still train. And, yeah, I, I can't complain, really. So it's, it's been, I've been really fortunate. Still training. You're still training, which is a great effort, which is what Sam Whitelock should be doing because are you a free agent now, Sam? Is that what we're talking about, the fact Japan's season is over? I'm pretty sure there'll be a number of franchises looking for guys who's played over 100 test matches in the middle of their scrum. What's your plan? Yeah, so at the moment, um, the Japan competition's been completely cancelled, so it's pretty, uh, you know understanding that it happened, but we were pretty gutted. Uh, we were sitting pretty well on the table at that stage, so a few big games coming up, but for us, uh, we're in, back in New Zealand at the moment, and we'll make our way back to Christchurch once uh, we're allowed to travel a bit further, so we'll head back there and um, hopefully meet back up with the Crusaders or Canterbury or whatever competition kicks off first. Uh, so your committee, is, is the Crusaders it? Is it Christchurch? That's it? That's the only option? Yeah, of course it is. Oh, I thought the trip down to Dunedin might have been handy. All right, mate. Hey, thanks very much, Sam. Thanks, Les. Uh, keep up the great work you are doing behind the scenes, which we know it's critically important to our game going forward. We're looking forward to seeing both of you back out there. More importantly, stay safe, stay healthy. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much. You guys too. Thanks, Sam. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Well, with no live rugby, I'll tell you what has happened. There's been plenty of people talking about their best ofs, their best players, their toughest players, fastest players, you name it. Everyone's been going on about it. Stephen Jones, Stuart Barnes, they had the same consensus. Who was one of the hardest and toughest men in the game? Well, it was Wayne Shelford Buck. And there's no doubt we know here in New Zealand how tough he was. For you, Mills, maybe. For you, JK, who were, who were they? Who were the toughest men that you played with or against? Well, they've already gone to buck so that's a given but i'll give you a name that'll make you shiver mark cowboy shaw i was about to say you were going to say cowboy right he didn't mind a scrap didn't mind didn't mind uh, one at all just yeah, quiet and yeah. he went looking for you know, it. is that what you're saying you know so he was so strong because he used to punch briskets in the freezing works with his left hand oh, <laughs> he went rocky on sores, it mate before they had sores mills oh, oh, he oh. went all rocky on it oh, oh we're, we're a different generation out. mills we had him for the under-19s as a coach, and we always had heard the stories about him and the mongrel dog and the things like that. So very scary man. But I'd, ha I'd have to say probably in my generation, it would have to be a, a Jerry Collins. And he's a guy that, you know, you could easily hit with a, an iron bar, and he'll still keep going. He's just one of those guys you just didn't want to go down his channel during sort of those uh, those drills that you did at, uh, at, uh, at trainings and that. A very, very hard man. We're going to go from talking about hard men. We're going to talk about finishes. And there's no doubt, over time, the Blues have had some of the very, very best. Let's have a look at some of those who have donned the Blues jersey in Super Rugby. Lovell in space. Two, he's almost there, he's there. Although, you never know. Give it to 
down now. You never know. Welcome back to Breakdown. World Rugby is preparing to vote for its leader. And the two candidates are two people deeply entrenched in the system already. First, Bill Beaumont, 68 years old, a former captain of England. He is the current chair. The man challenging him, former captain of Argentina, 45-year-old Augustine Pichot. They are two very different candidates. Let's see what they are offering. Bill Beaumont, four years in the big chair already, and he's wanted to keep his deputy, Bernard Laporte, with him. They're a truck and trailer unit. Obviously, they're a package deal, aren't they? Let's have a look at their five-point mandate. Number one, governance reform of world rugby structures. They want to reinforce the international structure, focusing on nations outside of the big players. They want to strengthen finances, and they'll need to after their $167 million payout in a relief package to the global game. They want to accelerate the development of women's rugby and promote greater player dialogue with a particular focus on player welfare. So what is Pichot offering? Well, in one word, it's change. He wants to secure investment to protect the future of the game. He wants to support established and emerging unions. He's hot on that one. And he wants to create a global game, ensure there's a complementary realignment of the global calendar. Now, Pichot is very big on boosting emerging nations who he feels don't have a pathway to the bigger stage. For example, he uses Japan, an incredible host of the Rugby World Cup, a wildly successful event, yet Japan are not part of an established competition. It's also interesting to note that in Beaumont's press release, he states that world rugby has made great game-changing progress over the last four years, and world rugby accelerates into a, and I quote, new decade in great shape. Perhaps the biggest irony of all, though, is his promise to get off the ground a global competition. He's had four years to do it. It hasn't happened. So you can understand why there's some skepticism, some doubt, that he will do it in the next four, should he be re-elected. I'm talking about the Nations Championship, the top 12 teams from both hemispheres playing each other annually. The top two, of course, go on to play in a final. It's just the kind of lifeline the emerging nations desperately need. And financially, world rugby needs this too. But with some Six Nations sides, wanting to share the love and share the joys and treats for fear of relegation to me it's a case of the tail wagging the dog there is an appetite for change world rugby needs to embrace change what that will look like and who's going to do it remains to be seen so if we talk about that then bernie and we talk about the big picture the global picture the decisions that are going to be made this weekend have we got the right pig Paul JK, uh, um, Mills uh, is this. He's ready to go. He's firing his shots. He can't wait any longer. No, I'm oh. doing my breathing to stay. So here's my problem. I believe that the whole Southern Hemisphere should boycott the selection. So both Pichot and Beaumont have five points when we don't even know what our game looks like at the moment. So it's totally irresponsible that World Rugby want to have a vote this Sunday. I mean, how can you talk about any competition right now, right? First thing. So they should put it off because it's irresponsible. 
how can we vote for the right person if we don't know what the competition looks like, first thing. Second thing is, I hate hearing about the second tier nations all the time when they never give them a vote. So the problem is our constitution at World Rugby is wrong. So the top unions get two votes and then the other smaller unions get one vote. So every 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 single vote, you see one 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 union go out on a limb. This time it's Fiji. Are they going to be in a position of power? No, because they're not going to get a vote. I'll finish. I, I say this to Bill Beaumont and Pichot, you go away, let Bill Beaumont run the game for the next 8, 10, 12, 14 weeks till after Christmas, but then you guys come back with a mandate saying, we're going to have a world competition and Samoa is going to get 8 to $10 million. You know, tell it, we've been promised this stuff in the past and the poor are getting poorer, you know? And yeah. all, especially the Pacific Island players are playing through France, through the UK, you know, we, we, we want to see some something concrete for a change. I'm sick of seeing those five things that you're going to do when you... you it's just... No, nah, don't. <sighs> Bernie, sorry. Yeah, but I, I'm talking about leadership. I agree. The thing is, um, Pichot himself has said that he's staggered that this vote is going ahead. So he has, has red flagged that. But also, JK, I've read the mandates. They are both very light on detail. And that is something that no one is getting. And I suspect it's because they simply cannot. It's crystal ball gazing. It is guesswork. All they can do is offer their leadership at a stage where no one knows what direction rugby is going globally. Well, there is no doubt. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding the game right now, particularly on a global level, on a global scale. We're going to catch up with Conrad Smith, talk about the situation in France. But we're going to look inside, in and around the players and one of their best representatives, particularly here in New Zealand, going abroad. Cy Porter joins us now from Halo Sports. And Cy, these, like I said, are uncertain times. When you look at the landscape globally, how much is it changing from a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, well... I think everyone's. Um, I think everyone's got over the initial shock now. I think, and um, everyone's taking a bit of a breath, getting their house in order, and really trying to work out what it's going to look like. Not just for for the current season, whether that's the north northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, but are trying to work out what this means for the game moving forward. Um, is this an opportunity to tinker, to make changes? Um, is everyone going to survive? Um, or, or, you know, do, are we going to have to rehash and remodel things? Even before COVID-19, this talk about sustainability. We did a review here in New Zealand. Global Rugby is talking about looking at doing a review as well, an independent review. Is sustainability now the big thing that's on the table? The fact that everyone, clubs are involved, um, uh, unions are involved, World Rugby are involved in looking at going, you know what? The landscape is so different that we have to address everything across the board involved with our game? Well, I think if if we don't, it's a missed opportunity. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people talk around how um, nobody's worked closer together, nobody's tried to be more collabor collaborative, etc. And that's not because everyone all of a sudden has decided they want to, to get on and sing Kumbaya and stuff. They've been forced into this situation. So we need to make the most of that, I think. And, and it would be a lost opportunity if uh, we don't look to the future and look how we can create sustainability, how the wealth is shared around the place, where the power base of the game is, uh, when we can play global matches. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we're not going to tinker with it now, we never will. In your neck of the woods, in your speciality, if you could change something right now to help the global game, what would that be from your point of view, from an agent's point of view, from a player's contract's point of view? Gee, that's a good question. Um, I think the, the global window, I think it, it, it really does impact on people's decisions around club play and if the one thing i think that rugby's really got which is an advantage over other winter codes and a lot of sporting codes is we have meaningful international competition every year like we don't have the friendlies you know we have the rugby championships we have the six nations you know we kind of have tests that that really matter um but we've only got a few countries playing in them um, you know, we need to spread that net wider. We need to find ways where 
uh, the system allows um, the emerging countries, I don't like that term, but you know, the, the second tier, I don't like that term either, but the other countries, an ability to actually compete. And that's not turn up on a Monday jet lagged, assemble six days before a competition, you know, before a match and go out and play. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, some of these, um, like a Japan can go to a uh, World Cup and play well because they could assemble for half the year. You know, whereas when we, when we send the Pacific Nations up in June, uh, sorry, uh, up to up north, you know, they're together for five, six days. They might get through the first game, but then, you know, they just can't prepare properly. And, and so we've got to find a way to address that and let all these teams play on an even keel or as even as we can. Because you're not, you're not going to be able to keep all the players in one place. They are going to be distributed around the world. But don't put barriers in front of them wanting to play for their country and then being able to actually perform at their best for their country. That was nice of you, so I call them the poor nations because the wealth is not distributed properly. So I can say that you can't. I understand that. Oh, it didn't come into my mind, John. I just couldn't think of a, a term to call them. <laughs> Look, there's been a lot of talk about this domestic competition, this opportunity, like you've talked about, the fact whether it's super rugby teams or national provincial sides. So all of a sudden, for a lot of guys to have come back, uh, the opportunity for them to not to go overseas and play in, they are here in New Zealand now. Are you having conversations with guys knowing, you know what, maybe I sign off with a year of Mitre uh, 10. You know, do I finish my career doing that or do I play a, a season here, ask for some dispensation for other clubs? Do you strap your boots back on thinking you want another run around? I, I mean, think Millsy wants that... to. Millsy's got no, 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 Millsy wants no. to play. Oh, um, mate, I, 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 no I, way that's happening. No <laughs> way. <laughs> so are you, Look, are you uh, selling Mills? Are you selling Mills? You're putting Mills out there. He's up yeah, and yeah. Oh, mate, if, if he wants to, he can. Um, <laughs> well, he's just such a wonderful broadcaster. I just don't think he needs to anymore. No, look, guys are asking the question, and even if it's people that are home uh, between Japanese seasons or whatever, the, the problem is everyone's going to be a bit different, and it's just a risk thing. You know, if, you, if, if, if uh, Japan comes back online or France comes back online and and that's your livelihood, and it's even more riskier now than it was. You know, if you pick up an injury, will clubs be as um, understanding if you turn up injured, etc.? It's a big risk uh, to to play. But then again, um, you know, I am to be interested in, in uh, John's view on this as a coach. If if your guys aren't playing for eight months, maybe you want them to play. And you want them to get out there and, and not collect rust or whatever. And it might be in, in um, Smithy at Kobe's interests to try to get some guys out playing Mitre 10 Cup. But then there's also all sorts of things like eligibility. Um, if you're trying to be a time server to play for Japan, what can you do? There's tax residency issues. Um, there's all sorts of things that just come into it. So I think there's this beautiful romantic notion that we can go out and play the best Mitre 10 Cup that we've ever had. It'd be like watching all of you guys back in the back in the day. And that would be, personally, I think it'd be an amazing thing to to relaunch New Zealand after this and, and the rugby community. But, um, you know, I don't know if we can rely on a whole lot of overseas um, stars coming back and playing. But we're going to have so many players here who are contracted, who are absolutely chomping at the bit who are going to want to be playing anyway. So um, whilst you might see some household names back, um, you know, from what I'm hearing from the players and the coaches, they just want to tear into it as soon as they can and just, you know, do what they love and and do what we all want to watch. Um, and fingers crossed um, we can get out there soon enough and we can get two competitions in, in a domestic yeah. Super and a Mitre 10 Cup. That would be perfect, I reckon, but... Don't have my crystal ball, unfortunately. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well, but that's from your basement right now. And usually you're on the road. You spend most of your time in a plane at the moment. It's been all being done from New Zealand, I'm sure, on Zoom like everybody else. But, mate, keep busy. Keep working on your short game and look after that family of yours. Stay safe. Take care. Look Thanks, to guys. Soon, Lovely to chat. Thank you. Cheers, buddy. Ciao. Well, I'll tell you what we have established, the fact that Mills is not coming out of retirement. He's going to t remain a TV star, but also as well for that, uh, JK, the fact that this is really complex for players across the globe. And any changes that are going to be made, it's going to be very difficult in the short term to really sort some of these things out. Yeah, I think you've got so many different contractual situations to blend through. The thing that interests me as well is, you know, would some of our 
players that are playing overseas want to play Mitre 10 to risk getting injured to maybe not get a contract. So I think it's really complex. But once again, it also highlighted, I mean, Cy Porter come up and said, you know, this is an unfair game. We've got some of the, well, he didn't even know what to call them. Sick. I just called them our poor nations because that's what's happening. You know, that's why I think getting back to it, our game needs to change. And having a vote now for world rugby, I think is wrong. So not only should New Zealand boycott it, so should Samoa and Tonga. You probably can't get Fiji to boycott it now because they're trying to get into a position of power. But it's wrong, it's complex. But right now our game is facing big change. So we need to take some time to make sure that we set our game up for the next 20 years evenly. Let's not leave these poorer nations behind anymore. Mills, you've got to talk about as well the fact that in terms of contractually, it's going to be very, very difficult for a number of clubs to commit. If you start talking about big contracts that overseas, there'll be existing ones that people are committed to. So there may still be a layer of players there, though, who have got some big question marks about where their future lies and what actual competitions are going to be going ahead. Oh, absolutely, Jeff. And I think it's it's pretty complicated and, you know, there's no certainty in it, in it all and everything's still up in the air. We're, st we're still only sort of a month down here in New Zealand. Other countries are facing different things. And I tend to agree, uh, you know, with, with JK, you know, we're, we're, we possibly need to, you know, make sure we, we settle everything else and get some real clarity around what's going on in, in the game first before we, you know, we, we go into this sort of vote. And uh, I can understand that they're wanting someone there to lead that. But the game is, there's just so much uncertainty globally in, in the game that we, we just haven't quite got that right yet. Well, there's been plenty of talk of whether or not we might see the All Blacks back into NPC rugby after the break. We're going to catch up one of those former All Blacks who would love to have played in the competition. He has done it before, Conrad Smith. Conrad Smith, well, he's new boy on the block. Back on the inside for Smith. Good play from the centre. Across the hand, big gap opens up again. It back inside, and here's a chance for Conrad Smith looking for somebody to give it to. He doesn't need to, and Smith goes in. They've still got it. Here's Conrad Smith. He's got Callum with him. Conrad Smith scores. We're going to hold this. Now, kick into space from Steinmetz, and he's got the bounce, and he's got it away to Conrad Smith. Welcome back to The Breakdown. Well, earlier this morning, Mills and I had an opportunity to go to France, Po, and catch up with Conrad Smith. Conrad, I suppose it's challenging for everyone around the world. What, what's been happening for you? How's it uh, happened and gone about? And I suppose, where are you at right now? Um, yeah, it's been, it's been a challenging uh, month or so with the club and here, here in France, obviously, uh, yeah, the country's been in um, lockdown or isolation for, for over a, a month now and, and it announced earlier this week that that's going to continue for another four weeks. So for the club, it's, um, it's meant that you know, obviously we haven't been able to train and it's just been trying to track the players, keep in touch online and, um, and await an outcome of, of the, the league who are going to decide on the future of the competition and they, ha they haven't cancelled it yet. Um, I think even from the start, that seemed like the obvious uh, decision that would be made. But when you think about, you know, a lot of the clubs immediately said that they'd, they'd go under, you know, when you're talking about Division Two clubs as well, who are professional, they, um, a lot of those clubs would fold if the, if the competition was, was simply stopped. So they've taken their time. There's still not a decision made and they're desperate for, for a few games to be played, even to earn some television dollars. Um, but yeah, so it's all a bit in limbo. And then when you're dealing with, foreign players it's been particularly hard um, because a lot of them want to get home but um, contractually they're, they're not allowed to you know especially when if the competition were to restart they'd be required to come back and play and yeah so it's been a real it's been a real uh, battle on a lot of fronts over the last few weeks and you yeah, know signs of it clearing up just yet either. Connor I just want to ask I know has there been a bit of correspondence if you mentioned the fact that a lot of guys uh, contractual wise they're not allowed to go home so has there been a bit of correspondence between you know different clubs in terms of the way they deal with certain things or is it just a case of 
uh, you guys go off and do your thing, and uh, you know, Toulon also will go off based on uh, based on the ownership. No, for, for sure. You know that that was the first thing. Um, you know, like I say, when I start, we have a, a lot of New Zealanders um, at, at the club, and immediately, you know, times like these, you, you instinctively want to go home, and, and there were guys asking me to go home, and. You know, you, you talk to the club, it's not an easy question. So, you know, there's enough of us around the place in France. I was straight on the phone talking to guys in La Rochelle, John O'Gibbs, and asking guys over in, in Lyon and Toulon and, you know, how how, you, how we're all dealing with this. And, um, yeah, because it's, it's it's not straightforward, you know, the answers. It's, it's something totally new for everyone. So um, but that, that's certainly been the way we, we've gone about it. Um, and, yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, even from New Zealand, the Players Association of New Zealand being really good keeping contact with uh, most of the guys that are playing here in France and just uh, keeping them abreast with all the developments around the world and, and, and what, what's happening here in France as well. Yeah, look, the agreements that have had to happen between clubs and players and unions and players and payments, New Zealand and our Players Association, you just mentioned them, they came to an agreement about where they sit and, and the freezes that are going to go in place to try and protect the game. What was the conversation that, that was had in France and, and how has that played out and, and where are the finances and how stable and, and what have the players done in terms of that, in terms of those relationships and their contracts right now? Yeah, that, that's, that's ongoing and um, it's, <laughs> I'd like to say it's as well organised as it is in New Zealand in terms of a players association that can unite the, the player views and, and reach an agreement with the union. But here in France, um, it's a lot more complicated. And, and to be honest, because of the, the club structure, you know, they're all um, ind independently owned. So Preval, the equivalent of the Players Association in, here in France, they've tried to, um, I, I suppose, find a, a position that all the players can, can sort of take up with the, the clubs because it all has to be, and that's another complication, is, is under French law, it ha all has to be dealt with individually. It, it can't be dealt with you know, on a broad basis, or, you know, cuts across the board, across the board. And, um, but so Preval have tried to come out with a measure, the, 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 the LNR who run the competition have tried to estimate the losses for the club and they've found, you know, a figure around 30%. And so that's what they're hoping to guide players in their individual contracts. But it's, it's all still to be seen. And then, so now it's left to each club, all the players hopefully will, will join together within the club and sort of, whether they take 30% or 20% or who knows, but to, to help the clubs then bargain them. But ultimately, it still has to be done individually. And yeah, wow. there's a lot, a lot of work still to go under the, the bridge, um, you know, over here with that. Snaky, I suppose in some ways, you know, you, you've seen how the system works in New Zealand and, and everything that's sort of been incorporated. And there's always sort of talk about going to private entities and that. But I suppose now you're, you're actually dealing with that. Uh, yeah, there is complications there, but in terms of the foreigners, I want to go back to the foreigners. If this, let's just say it doesn't go ahead this year, what security do you guys actually have uh, in terms of you know how it's sort of created over there or what they've got in place? Have they spoken about the fact that you could basically, with the competitions, you know, not going through? Because I suspect you would have been looking at at uh, you know bringing some players, recruitment, and things like that. Now all of a sudden, is is that all up in the air in terms of? The foreigners and, and where they sit in, in, in their contracts? Yeah, it, it's, I suppose it's different for different guys. I mean, the one thing that it's hard on is the guys that come off contract at the end of this season um, because, you know, it's a season that's obviously in jeopardy and, and then they're now looking where they were in a pretty good position because they were beginning to, most of them were negotiating. If they hadn't secured a contract already, they were looking. And um, But now all the clubs are suddenly not really in a position to commit. They're trying to just work with what they've got. They, they certainly don't have funds sitting aside to, to contract players. So, um, you know, we, we've got a couple of guys, you're talking about foreigners, um, coming off contract. And now, you know, that they... For one thing, they're going to be stuck in France, potentially then not receiving any income and then not w without a contract to go to. Um, the guys that are still on contract, um, you know, they, they will be looked after, like the contracts will be honoured. That For all the complications with the different ownership models, that, you know, France, French employment law in particular is very good for employees. And so, you know, the, the, the contract will get honoured. They'll have to negotiate, a, obviously, a pay cut, and the players have been quite open with that, you know, around the world. But, um, 
you know, certainly you won't see guys losing contracts. It's just going to be hard for the guys that are coming off contracts and, and trying to find new deals around the world. And that, that's the same anyway, I think. The landscape's changing. The landscape is changing. Uh, we know this weekend coming up, there's a big vote going on at World Rugby. Uh, the fact that uh, Augustine Pichot is going up against Sir Bill Beaumont. There's this, you'd have to say, a division between um, uh, World Rugby or, or within its um, uh, numbers itself. The fact that there's a northern and southern hemisphere push. There's a push, obviously, for some change. Is that a conversation that's going on in France? Is that a relevant conversation? Uh, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, um, most of it, I mean, Bernard Laporte's positioned himself pretty well and he, he seems to be figuring as the vice president for both. So, you know, from a French perspective, that's um, you know, that's good for them. They're going to have a, a French person high, high up and within world rugby. And um, it, it's more like France are pretty open to a lot of the ideas, a lot of the conversation I know is around the, the nation's championship or whatever it's named. Um, and France is pretty supportive. I, their club system obviously is a sometimes seen as a roadblock to that, but you know the, the owners, as long as they're involved in the conversations, they love the idea of rugby being bigger. You know, the bigger market, the money men. They, they love the idea of growing it commercially. Um, so I, I think you know, and even with the nations championship that was talked about last year, the French were actually pretty supportive. Even the the club presidents, as long as they still get their place in the market and able to make their money, then. Um, and, and so it's, it's from a French perspective, they're, they're supportive of it. And um, I, I think they're just interested to see the, um, you know, between Bill and Gus that they, uh, I don't know about taking sides. So they're just uh, interested spectators at the moment. So, yeah, I mean, do you, do you see the, the actual competition, the French? I mean, you've always seen it in the national side, always hot and cold. Don't know what you're going to sort of get. And there's always been a cry of perhaps, you know, the club competition, you know, you know pulling back from some of those foreigners. Now there's, there's going to, it's, got, it's imminent that you know there's going to be a limited amount of them go you know go over there because of the shortage of money. Do you see the actual competition you know being as as as, as good without them um, with the, with a limited stock of, of foreigners? Should that happen? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I I know you know a lot of something that you know probably the New Zealand public aren't aware of. It, it, the regulations themselves have limited the foreigners um, significantly. Even at the time I've been here, they. They have a, a GIF requirement, so a player trained um, and brought up within the club system then qualifies um, within the – and you've got a number of players that have to be um, GIF qualified each year. And that number has increased every year by one. And so when I arrived, you could have 11 foreigners on the field. Um, now it's down to 17, so you're only allowed eight, and that's going to increase again. And, and so things like that, like behind the scenes, the FFR, you know, the LNR even, they are making real changes to, to develop and to promote um, lo local players. And, and it is having an effect on the league, no doubt. The, the amount of players that we sign is radically dropped, you know, foreign players I'm talking about. So um, how, how that breeds into the, the competition itself, the rugby's been really good. I think it's even got better. Um, the French team, the Six Nations, you know, before this came along, we were, we were looking really strong. And whether it's a result of that or whether it's, you know, the coaching change as well that they've made, I don't know. But I, I think the top 14 is, is still in a good place. It's going to be a real challenge how they come out of this. But, um, you know, the rugby's still really good. And um, there have been some, you know, pres pretty positive signs from what I've seen. Not sure whether you've been keeping an eye on it. But back here in New Zealand, of course, there's a lot of chat and a lot of discussion about the fact if there isn't to be international rugby played this year, a possibility of a fully loaded national provincial championship. The fact all of a sudden, all the All Blacks go back. They're talking about a North-South game. I mean, how excited does that make you as a former player, the fact that maybe we're going to see our very, very best go back to their provincial unions and then all of a sudden we'll have a full-blooded national provincial championship. Is there an appetite in your mind to watch that? And two, the fact maybe a North-South game, would you have loved to have been part of a contest like that? For sure, and I think um, you know the novel, the novelty factor itself is um, is going to be hugely appealing, and um, you know for myself, and, and I know a lot of foreigners um, would, would enjoy watching that sort of rugby. You know, it's just a sustainability question where, whether that can um, you know keep the money and the dollars rolling in and, and become a proper competition. You know, five, ten years down the line, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to think that it could, but. Uh, you know, there's probably others that know more about the commercial markets that would say it can't. But, um, you know, for, for sure, especially coming out of all this, 
I think there's a lot of positivity that there could be something novel, something great that you know fans could be attracted to. It's similar with the international season, I, I think if we can't do the similar you know July, November tests, I, I think we could find something that people actually enjoy even more, and, and that could be good for rugby in the long run. Do you have some good memories of those times, and when you're when you're playing NPC footy? Yeah, for sure. You know, I was fortunate. You know, when I started, I, I think it was literally the last year we, from Wellington perspective, we had really good crowds. I remember playing round robin games to full full houses. You know, it was yeah. um, that was back in what was it, oh three. And, yeah, we don't um, go on to dates world. in this show. We just sort of hang out where we are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, it was great. I was here. You know, it was um, it was. It was a big time, you know, playing NBC. So, you know, for sure, I'd, I'd love to see that that again. And, um, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, hopefully, like, like I say, I'm, I'm sure there's uh, something good like that could come out of all this. Well, Conrad, thanks very much, mate. You've had four weeks in lockdown already, in isolation. You've got four weeks in front of you, mate. How, how have you dealt with it? Just lastly, how have you dealt with it? How are you coming through it conditioning-wise? I mean, what's, what's, <laughs> what has been your go-to to, you know, your two young kids... <laughs> Uh, what's it? What's it been all about? What's the survival mode for you been like? The, the, I think like I, I think like the Kiwis I've been talking to. It, once you the, the stress beforehand was a lot worse than the reality of the situation. You know, everyone was panic buying, and it was the same over here in France. But then once everyone settled in, the first couple of weeks was really good. You know, you had a lot of family time. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wasn't doing a lot of work, so I could help my. Um, help, you know, a wife, with, we sort of share time teaching the kids and playing with the kids and it, it's dragged on a bit too long, but um, no, it's been cool. There's been some good lessons come out of it. You know, I think even the people that, you know, realise some of them work too much, too, too, too much time away from home, even myself, maybe a little bit, but uh, no, so it's, it's, it's been okay. It, it's certainly, um, you know, it's going to change things. I, I think everyone's saying that. You know, there's no going back to normal won't be the same normal, that's for sure. So um not not just for rugby but for everyone. So it's it's been fascinating being here in France. The 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 pull of home at times like these is really strong and you know, my wife and I talk all the time about how it would be different if we we're back home. So that's been challenging. But um other than that it's been it's been okay. Mate, you're still smiling. You, you look as though you're on top of it. Thanks once again. Yeah. Take care, you and your family, and we hope to catch up with you and talk to you again very, very soon. Cheers, mate. Sounds good. Cheers, fellas. Well, we've got seven more days of Level 4. There's bound to be plenty happen. We've talked about it on tonight's show. Bernie's come back in. And Bernie, for you, you know where you are. You know what you're doing. I mean, for you, dealing with this, I mean, how engaged are you in the fact that at least there's some stories to talk about? Well, always stories to talk about, Jeff. But I'll be wearing pink uh, shirt and pink pants next week. And if JK's already started his heavy deep breathing now, what hope is there for the rest of us? Oh, JK's on top of it, mate. You're looking sharp. You're busier than ever. Mentor Me has got off the ground last week, and it looks as though things are going well. Yeah, and just a big congratulations to New Zealand. You know, it's been a big ask for everyone. It's been challenging for us all. I'm just really proud of us as a nation uh, that we've stuck to our guns, and, you know, we're trying to get on top of this. So I've been in here a long time, one more week. We'll get through it. We'll get through it together. So... You know, it's been a really interesting week for me. Look after yourselves, look after your mental health, and we're going to nail it. So it's all good. Looking forward to seeing and talking to you guys next week. Don't forget, Team Kirsty Stanway, Wednesday, Sunday night, Isolation Nation. That's all from the breakdown. We'll see you next Tuesday night.